light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me I didn't mean that we might be surprised that they made it 50 years. I want that to be clear. I didn't, I, I didn't think somebody would think that, but somebody may have. And I didn't want especially Sonny and Jan to think that I meant that at all. Uh, again, we're glad that you're here. Take your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 as we uh, get ready to study for a few moments uh, this morning together. Uh, it was announced in the prayer that O.L. Wallace, uh, he's had a lot of back trouble lately and he is uh, uh, going to be having surgery in the morning at ECM. I also received a call just a few moments before services from Julia Wesson and she said that uh, she is home this morning, that they spent the night in the emergency room with uh, Abby, her granddaughter. Abby was in a car accident last night, uh, flipped her car over, but she is okay. Uh, she's fine, but they were just there last night at the emergency room, and uh, she did not even tell Miss Viola or Miss Mary. So if you call them to check on them, make sure you don't say anything to Miss Viola or Miss Mary, because that would that would definitely worry them as well. But uh, she she seems to be fine, and, and Julia will probably be back with us uh, this evening. Someone's developed personality test based on how you decorate your Christmas tree. Have you uh? How many of you have, have put up your Christmas decorations, if you, if you do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd like to find out in some capacity. I don't know how we'd do it. Uh, anybody here got more than 10 trees? I heard someone yesterday that had 53 trees in their house. 53 trees that they decorated. They have a whole storage building that they have to rent. That's right. <laughs> it's not us. It's not us. Uh, that they have to rent to make sure they, they store all their decorations for. We decorate this time of year and uh, the holiday season and some of the personality tests based on how you decorate your tree. If you have nothing but multicolored lights on your tree, it says that you're an extrovert. You're probably an extrovert. If you only use white lights, <coughs> usually that means you're the type of person, <coughs> excuse me, who's going to ask his guests to remove their shoes when they walk through the front door. If you use blinking lights on your tree, you have ADD. If your tree has homemade ornaments, you have a lot of children. If you string popcorn to put on your tree, you have way too much time on your hands. If you use nothing but red decorations, you secretly wish you lived in a department store. If your tree has a vague evergreen smell, then you bought a healthy tree. If it has a strong, if it has a vague evergreen smell, then you bought a healthy tree. If it has a strong evergreen smell, then you sprayed it with pine saw. And if it's just plain smelly, then you probably have a dead bird in your tree somewhere. So those, you know, that's something a little lively here to, to think about as we look at decorating for Christmas. Now, I like the background for the, the series that we're going to be doing, and as I mentioned, we don't know when Jesus was born. There's no exact day that we can pin to say, and, and I almost find it irreverent for someone to say, happy birthday, Jesus. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of those people. But like I said, the world needs Jesus now more than ever. We need Jesus, and the world takes the time to celebrate this as the birth of Christ. And, and I know we all say, well, we should celebrate the birth of Christ every year. But we don't, do we? Or every day, but we don't. We don't celebrate the birth of Christ every day. Every Sunday we gather around the Lord's table and we honor the death, as we mentioned just a few moments ago, as we focused on last week. We mentioned the, the death and we honor the death. But if it weren't for the birth, there would not be no death. So as the world takes the time to do this, I think it would be fine for us to do it as well. So as we look at this story in Luke chapter 2, as the colors of Christmas and how 
Christmas represents so many things to so many people, and we decorate in so many ways. I want us to look at some of these colors. The first color we're going to talk about in this series is the color green. On the door. A lot of you may have garland that, that you've wrapped around. You may even have some, some green ornaments like this. And we have, it's just green is, is everywhere. And when, when we think about green and what it represents for, the first point that I want you to see is that this green, the color green that we have, it's going to signify new life. It's going to signify new life. We're going to look in just a moment at the, at the birth there of Jesus in, in Luke chapter 2, just a few of the verses about it. But when you think of this time of year, when you go outside, you know, we worked a little bit in the yard yesterday and took care of some leaves and, and some things. Life is not the word that comes to your mind when you look outside. Now, we have a pretty blue sky, and, and the sun is beautiful in the clouds, but when you look down at the grass... It looks dead, doesn't it? It's brown, for the most part. It's brown. Then you got these leaves that have fallen off of the trees. And they look dead. Well, but if you look at the trees, they look, they look barren, don't they? They, they just look like they're, they're barren. There's, there's nothing there. They, they look cold. Even though it may not be cold, it looks cold. It looks as though that that's, that's just not the... You just don't think of the word life. But when you think of the color green, you do. You think of fresh cut grass. You think of leaves on a tree. You think of flowers blooming. So as we look at the color green, that, that color green in itself just kind of symbolizes, it symbolizes new life for us. Luke chapter 2. The time it came in the days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the census should be taken to all the inhabitants of the earth. <clears throat> Verse 4, When Joseph went to, from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David which was called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the family of David, in order to register, along with Mary, who was engaged to him, and was with child. And it came about that while they were there, days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths. She laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for them. As you look at the time of Christmas as the world is focusing on Christ, it, it's going to symbolize this color green that we have. It's going to symbolize for us a new life. But this is not just any life. I mean, this was the life of the Son of God. This is the life of Christ. This is the life of a being that spent an eternity up until this point in heaven and has now come into this earth from the womb of a woman to be wrapped in these swaddling clothes, to lie in a manger as, as a feeding trough kind of thing that we might think of. See, Christmas, for some, and, and we're going to look at it, it's going to symbolize a new life. It's not just any life. And this life is very significant. Because this life, this has been the culmination of things for a long time. The culmination of things have been coming for a long time and been building for a long, long time. Hold Luke 2 and go to the reading that I asked it a few moments ago in Galatians. In Galatians, the book of Galatians chapter 4. You might think, what in the world does that have to do?
Jesus' birth, when he was born, God had planned this from the dawn, before the dawn of time, from before creation, that this was going to happen. And the passage says here in Galatians that when the time had fully come, when the fullness of time had came, when it was time for this to happen, God had set this time up. He knew that it would be during this time. He knew it would be during this census. He knew it would be at this specific moment in the history of the world that this new birth was going to come into the world and this new birth was going to symbolize the change of everything as we know it. Because when this birth came, just as you look outside, the grass is dead. Just as you look at the leaves and you see deadness, just as you might look at an overcast sky and you think of the, you don't think, you don't see birds in the air, you don't see the sun, you don't think life, you think barren, you think death, you think a wasteland. That is exactly what the world was. Oh, you may have had some beautiful things in this world. But it was because of the sin of man, it was because of what had happened, and sin had pushed this world to a point where the creation, God said that all these things that he created at the very beginning, and God saw that it was good. It was all good. Well, it's not good anymore. Because ever since man took of that fruit, and Eve partook of that fruit, I say man in the general sense, when they took of that fruit, Peter says it this way, the world that then was. Meaning that the world now is different. It's different. Where Adam and Eve walked together in the cool of the day and, and talked with God. Where Adam had that close-knit relationship with God. Now our sins, as Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, have separated us from God. And that separation has caused a deadness, a wasteland, a barrenness, one that needs life breathed into it, one that needs a Savior to come and to bring life and to bring that back up so that we can bring that relationship back. Put it on the screen, or Mark put it on the screen for me here in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we know. of this punishment for the woman and for the serpent comes in this way. He says there's going to be enmity. Meaning, he, you are going to just bite at the heel of this offspring. And you're going to hurt it for a little while as a snake might bite the heel. And it might hurt. But when this offspring comes, man, he's going to crush your head. Some versions put it that way, that it's going to crush your head. That's when Jesus defeats death. But I want you to see something specific. It's the proto-evangelum. This is the first prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah. It doesn't say it will put enmity between your seed and the offspring of the man and the woman. It says, I will put enmity between you and her offspring. See, when Mary was given the child, there was no male that took part in that relationship. There was no male that placed the seed within her. God placed that seed. She didn't need the male. This was a virgin birth. So even 
from the creation of the world when, when God points this out. He says, this is going to come, it's going to come down where there's going to be a woman and that woman's offspring, not the offspring of a man and a woman. The woman's offspring is going to bring life back to this world because of what you have done here. You've separated me from my people. You've separated me from my wonderful good creation. And if it and have ruined the image of mankind that I have made in a pure, godly image after my own. It's been perverted. It's been changed. It's now dead. And there needs to be life. And that life's going to come, but it's going to come through the offspring of this woman. Go on to the next verse here. Isaiah chapter 7. And there About that in the past. Emmanuel means God with us. That relationship now restored back to life to where we have us and God can be reunited for a new life. In Romans chapter 6, verse 2 and 4, do you not know? that all of us who have been baptized in the all the way forth before the creation of the world, that when the fullness of time had come, we'll talk about more of this tonight, but when the fullness of time had came, and there's little hints of this all throughout Scripture, even in the life of Abraham, even in the life of Jacob, then you go to the life of Daniel, and the life of Nebuchadnezzar, and the dream, when the fullness of time came, in the days of those kings, this was going to happen, that Mary was going to give birth to a child, and that child was going to bring life. And you remember the words. We'll close on this thought this morning. And we'll look at the rest of the lesson tonight. But remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 10. Do you know what he said? I have come that you may have life, but not just regular life. If you got your Bibles open, you know what it says. You can mouth the words with me. A life more abundantly. Not only does this signify this, this Christ child going to signify just new life. He's going to signify the best life. A more abundant life. A life that has been brought about in the fullness of time that God had planned before the creation of the world. So when you see green, when you look at your tree, when you see the roof on your door, when, when you see the green lights that people have at their houses setting up, when, when you see all of those decorations of green, you think of that. What does that have to do with Christmas anyway? I, I didn't read, I didn't, I didn't look. I don't know what a tree has to do with Christmas. I don't know what that has to do with anything. As the world celebrates the birth of Christ, I don't know whether the tree came into play, but I do know as we look at it, now some of us have a little of those weird trees. You may have a blue one. You may have a green one. Lime green. Not just the regular. You may even have a white one. What do they call it? Flock? I mean, when they put the snow looking on it? I don't know. You may even have one of those old aluminum silvery trees. But when you see that color green, here's what you think of. You think of that, the life of Christ. That tree would be dead. That tree would be burned. The limbs would be dry and they'd be falling off. And there would be a huge mess on the floor. Because without Jesus, there is no life. 
but with Jesus. Not only that, does that tree thrive, that tree's decorated. That tree's beautiful. That tree has ornaments all over it. That tree is an abundant tree. And that's going to remind you. When Jesus came to this world, He said, I come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. And I'm excited about this series. We're going to look at the rest of the color green tonight. We're going to look at blue. I'm not dressing but We're going to think of all these colors and how they relate to the message of the cross. How they relate to the message of Jesus. So this morning as you, you look at your life, how's your life been? How would you classify your spiritual life? Would you think of your spiritual life as just apathetic? Let's look at it this way. If your spiritual life was symbol symbolized in a Christmas tree, what would it look like? Would it be beautiful, all the ornaments of the good works that you've performed all over it? Would the lights all be shining bright so others could see it? Would it be barren? Or would it be even one of those little Charlie Brown trees? If Jesus came that I might have life and I might have it more abundantly, then my tree needs to look like something. My life needs to reveal that. My life needs to be seen as an abundant life. One that I'm happy with. One that I'm excited about. One that's thriving. One that's growing. One that's bearing light. One that's bearing fruit. Look at your life this morning. How is your spiritual life? Is it dead? Is it apathetic? Is it barren? Is it a wasteland? Or do you have those lights and maybe a few of them are burned out or maybe most of them are burned? This morning, you can come and you can leave here with a light that's lit up, with a spiritual life that is going to light up the room, that is going to light up the world. So look at your life. If there's something amiss in it, Jesus is here. Your sins have separated you from Him. Your sins have separated you from the Father. But Jesus comes. And Jesus comes so that we can be reunited sharing that new life. Whatever your need is, please come as we stand and sing the invitation.